Uh, so I'm going to talk about floor trading. And, uh, and this is uh, joint work with my colleagues, uh, Jonathan and, and Dominic. Um, so let me just start off with some slides that I actually use in my undergrad class. So I think most of us here probably don't need to, new, need to see these slides, but I think it's kind of fun anyway. Um, so the NYSE was founded in 1792 and kind of famously under this buttonwood tree. Um, but pretty darn quickly, they had evolved to look uh, relatively uh, the way they would look for the next 200 years. So by the mid 1800s, they had their trading floor in a building at 11 Wall Street. Uh, and I think many of us, uh, like I can't speak for you, but even in my head, and certainly on the evening news, there is this kind of view of equity trading that looks kind of like the picture I have here. So you think of kind of this open outcry world where there's a big floor and lots of people yelling and screaming at each other. Um, but the, the, the kind of harsh truth is, uh, I think, instead of the evening news showing these guys, you know, with big facial expressions every time the stock market goes down, what they really should do today is they should show a bunch of blinking lights in a server farm in New Jersey. Um, so this is, this is kind of how most trading occurs today. Uh, so instead of kind of having that open outcry set up, we've got server farms. Uh, and a lot of the server farms aren't even located in the places you might think. Uh, they're in New Jersey or rural Illinois or Kansas. Uh, so there's been a big change to kind of the structure of, of a lot of the uh, equity markets. The interesting one uh, from a market design perspective is the NYSE. So even though most of these exchanges have gone to kind of fully automated trading, the NYSE operates this hybrid system where basically they have floor traders, human beings standing on the floor, interacting together, operating side by side with electronic trading. Uh, and so there's, I think, some interesting questions that kind of arise from, from having this kind of hybrid system. Um, so the question we really wanted to understand in this paper is in a world of high frequency trading and computerized trading and algorithms, can human beings standing on the floor still have a role? Can they, can they still be valuable? Um, and if you want to just kind of think about this from, you know, setting up a, some tension, algorithms are amazingly sophisticated. They have amazing computer power. You might be tempted to say that just by revealed preference, the fact that algorithms have been kind of increasing in market share suggests that human beings don't have much of a role to play. On the other hand, then why does the NYSE operate this hybrid system? Uh, and so we really want to look at whether floor traders can provide some benefit in modern financial markets. Uh, the way we're going to do this, of course, is back in March of 2020, as a result of COVID, they closed the NYSE trading floor. Uh, and this turns out to be actually a very interesting experiment. So I'll walk you through the details. Uh, but for the most part, the only thing that changes is they close the floor uh, and limit the ability of, of floor traders to submit the types of orders they used to submit. Uh, so we can use this to see whether or not floor traders actually still matter. Uh, and again, I don't know kind of what your prior is. You know, my prior was these algorithms have gotten pretty sophisticated. And I honestly, I think, expected to find that floor traders didn't add value anymore. Um, but we, we find pretty darn consistent evidence that floor traders still add value. Uh, so relative to a control group, I'll show you when the floor closes that spreads get worse, uh, pricing errors get larger. And then we try to actually dig in and understand a little bit about the mechanism. I'll show you that these results are concentrated in kind of the opening periods of the day. So if you imagine a process where overnight all sorts of information comes out, you have a hard time understanding when the stock first opens, what the demand and supply intersection is going to look like. That's where these floor traders actually seem to provide the most value. Uh, so basically I'll show you when complexity is high, that's where it actually looks like the, the floor traders can actually complement automation. Um, okay, so uh, I've only got 20 minutes and I could probably talk about this for two hours. So I'll, I'll kind of uh, speed along here. But let me give you just a quick outline. I'll spend just a couple of minutes talking about the structure of trading in U.S. equity markets, just to make sure everyone kind of has the, the necessary context. I will skim through the theory and existing evidence and not do it justice. And then I'll try to spend most of the time looking at exactly, uh, exactly what we do. Uh, so as I said, you know, it's not clear, given the different market structures of different exchanges, whether floor traders could still matter. Um, what I will mention is there's this interesting AER paper by Ator and, and Dorn, where they kind of look at what types of activities 
should be automatable? So what types of labor force jobs should be automatable? And what kind of comes out of that paper that I, I think to me at least um, made a lot of sense was basically tasks that are routine are much more easy to be automated, right? So tasks where you're kind of repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again, these are things that algorithms are really good at and in fact, often better than human beings at. On the other hand, things that are kind of complicated where it's, it's hard to kind of know moment to moment what's gonna happen next, that's where human beings, at least so far, still seem to actually add value relative to algorithms. And so we're gonna kind of tie into that idea um, I will also mention, again, and I won't do this justice, there, there is kind of a growing literature outside of the particular context we're going to look at, where people try to see whether or not algorithms do add value. Uh, so, for example, uh, there's a paper by uh, Madhavan and, and Hendershot uh, and Barclay, Hendershot and Cox, where they show basically that humans add value um, uh, in bond market transactions above and beyond uh, algorithms. There's a bunch of people now looking at kind of uh, household finance type questions. So do algorithms do a better job at underwriting loans? Um, but I think, you know, there's still quite a bit of, of open questions on when algorithms are beneficial and, and, and when, when maybe human beings will, will have the advantage. Um, again, I don't have time to kind of do the existing literature justice, but there's a ton of uh, papers that have looked into just the general role of algorithms. Uh, there are some papers that have looked at the role of electronic trading. Um, and there are even a, a subset of papers recently that have focused on another unique feature of the New York Stock Exchange, which is these designated market makers. The interesting thing I, I will just mention here is, in a lot of these papers, market makers were kind of shocked, but the floor still traded. Our paper is going to be almost a mirror image of that. So market makers are going to continue, the designated market makers are going to continue to trade even when the floor closes, but floor traders will not have access to interacting on the floor. So I think we're going to be kind of the mere, uh, uh, you know, image of, of what those papers look at. And then I'll also mention there's a related paper by Hu and Murphy where they look at closing auctions on the NYSE and NASDAQ. And I think they have pretty good evidence that at least on average, the NYSE closing auction tends to have worse quality than the NASDAQ closing auction. Um, but but there's a, a couple of other differences between um, the auctions besides just the role of floor traders. All right, so then in the interest of time, let me jump in and kind of tell you what we're going to do. So sample is going to be pretty normal stuff. So I'm going to look at, you know, U.S. equities, share codes 10 and 11. We have two filters and, and Gideon had asked me about this, so I looked into this a little bit more. So we kind of follow a lot of microstructure papers and exclude stocks that have dual class shares and stocks that have a market cap below 500 million. Um, and, uh, and so we do get rid of a lot of the micro cap stocks on the NYSC. We're going to, we're doing some robustness checks now to see if, if those cuts matter. Um, and then what are we going to do? Well, uh, we're going to look at basically standard market microstructure variables. Uh, many of you are aware of this. The, the Wharton database now has this intraday indicators database, which is great. So we don't even have to worry about computing these things and introducing error in the computations. So we're going to take proportional quoted spreads, spreads and proportional effective spreads uh, straight from the Wharton, data, Wharton database. Uh, for some of our measures, we will have to compute them ourselves because we need intraday stuff. And so we'll do that using the code from Holden and Jacobson. Uh, and then we're also going to compute Hasbro pricing errors. All right. So then let me give you a, a timeline of events here. So uh, ho hopefully this isn't a, a trigger for anyone. I'm going to go over and talk about the, the implementation of COVID again. Uh, so Wednesday, March 18th. Um, the NYIC announced that a floor trader had tested positive for COVID-19. If you guys actually remember back then, the pandemic was starting to kind of disrupt things, even in the weeks a little bit before that, right? So we did see a little bit of evidence of, you know, increasing in social distancing and, and things like that in the weeks up to this. Uh, but Wednesday, March 18th was really kind of the day for the NYSE where, where this really started to become an issue. So the NYSC then announced that starting that next Monday, the floor would be closed, right? What you actually do see if you go and just look at the popular press articles, of course, is uh, a lot of stuff starts changing instantly, right? Even before the floor closes Monday, there are people who stop coming into work at the floor. Uh, obviously, some people tested positive, lots of people are worried about it, and so on and so forth. Uh, so March 23rd is going to be then, you know, the actual closure of the floor. Again, as I said, one of the really I guess, you know, interesting things in our setup is designated market makers continue to operate. 
right? So basically everything they were doing, they still do. It's just electronically. They can't interact on the floor, okay? So there's really only two changes that happen. We've stopped people from interacting on the floor. That might in interrupt information flow, right? So people can't see facial expressions. They can't communicate the same way. They can't get a read on emotions. And then it also does constrain a little bit the ability of, uh, of these floor traders to execute a particular type of order, which is called the D order. Okay, so those are really the only changes that happen when the floor closes. Everything else can kind of happen the way it always did. Now, the interesting thing is on May 26th, they started reopening the floor. Um, but the interesting thing is they only, as of about a week ago, actually got to the point where things were starting to be business as normal. Uh, so they were operating at a reduced head count with huge social distancing measures until just about a week ago. Okay, so we want to know whether floor trading matters for market quality. Of course, there is a plethora of endogeneity concerns here, right? Traders, you know, choose whether they want to execute on the floor, and that might be related to market conditions. That might be related to firm conditions. So the way we're going to deal with this is a difference in difference regression. Um, we're going to do, I don't have time to cover this in great detail, but we're going to do this with two different control groups, with two different sets of identifying assumptions, and we basically find the same thing. So in one group, I'm going to match each NYSE stock to a control stock that is listed on NASDAQ, right? We're going to match these on price, volume, market cap, and industry. I'll show you quite a bit of evidence that it looks like these are, these are good counterfactuals. And in another set of, of analyses, what I'm going to do is, I think, make a different set of identifying assumptions that I think is probably even more innocuous. After Reg NMS, stocks listed on the NYSE can also trade on other market centers. And so what I will do is compare a stock listed on the NYSE to itself traded off the NYSE, right? That'll be the control set. Uh, and I'll show you, we get basically the exact same results when, when we do that, that additional um, set. So again, in, in terms of kind of identifying assumptions, we need to basically assume that the treatment stocks and the control stocks would have evolved similarly absent the closure of the floor. Um, for our NASDAQ stocks, kind of the, the crucial identifying assumption here is that basically nothing differentially affected NYSE stocks relative to NASDAQ stocks right at the close. I think one thing you could be reasonably concerned about is if you thought NASDAQ stocks tend to be more tech heavy and you thought they are going to be differentially affected by the pandemic, then you could actually still get a violation of the parallel trends assumption by simply comparing NYSE stocks to NASDAQ stocks. I will show you that doesn't actually seem to be an issue, but I think that's a concern you could have. On the other hand, I think our NYSE to NYSE control group fixes that concern. And in fact, the nice thing is I can even include firm by date fixed effects in that specification. So even if there are time varying shocks at the firm level in that setup, we absorb them out. So I think that setup ends up being pretty tight. Um, again, um, we still have to worry about some other things, right? So we still have to worry about uh, the, the stable unit treatment value assumption. Um, we've done quite a bit of work on robustness and, and I think these things tend not to be a, an issue in our setting. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll kind of skip through this and show you some results. Okay, so let me start off with results. First thing I'm going to do, for every result, I'm going to show you first the setting where we have NASDAQ stocks as our control group, then the results where we have NYSE stocks as the control group. So let me start off with effective spreads uh, with NASDAQ stocks as the control group. What you see in our difference in difference, so the coefficient of interest is this treated times after, is that basically, uh, effective spreads increased by nine basis points for NYSE stocks relative to control stocks on the NASDAQ after the floor was closed, okay? Uh, and that ends up being, I mean, for those of you, many of you probably know the magnitudes of these already, but that ends up being a very big shock, right? That's about a 50% increase relative to the unconditional mean spread. So these are, these are big effects. Let me show you the NYSE results. Again, these I think tend to be a little bit tighter in terms of the identifying assumptions. Uh, again, because we can include not just comparing a stock to itself, um, but we can include firm time date fixed effects. So even time varying shocks should be absorbed out here. And we see basically one to two basis point increases in spreads. So it's a little bit smaller of an effect, but that ends up again being 10 to 15% relative to the unconditional. mean. So those are again, pretty big effects. The other thing I'll mention is that in all of our tables, 
as we vary different control variables or vary the fixed effect specifications, the point estimates are remarkably stable. Uh, so if you're familiar with Emily Oster's work on uh, omitted variable bias and how to show there's kind of not an issue, this suggests actually that our identifying assumptions hold pretty well, right? And, and that we shouldn't be that worried about um, an omitted variable bias in these settings. Uh, I'll show you kind of the, the graphical evidence of this as well. And again, I think the graphical evidence looks pretty good and suggests the parallel uh, trends assumptions hold pretty darn well. So here are effective spreads. And this one is where NASDAQ is the control stock group. What you see is basically uh, these spreads evolved in lockstep step manner prior to the shock. Again, as COVID was increasing, as you'd expect, both NYSE and NASDAQ stocks got worse liquidity. Uh, but the important thing is our difference in difference will difference those things out. And what you see is basically the differential occurs basically right when the floor is closed, right? It largely persists. You see it closes a little bit when they partially reopen the, the exchange in May. Um, so I think the evidence, evidence is clear. Effective spreads get worse. Um, I will also mention that uh, one of my colleagues at Utah is an experimental researcher, and she has an interesting lab experiment which shows that if you give human beings the ability to trade manually or use algos, it actually turns out market quality is best when they do both. And so kind of surprisingly, that's exactly consistent with what we're finding here. All right, so then I want to examine quoted spreads to see if market makers are actually behaving differently. Uh, and of course, what do we find? Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, so again, the magnitudes I, I think are, are economically meaningful. We find with NASDAQ as the control group, of um, quoted spreads increased by two basis points, which is about 27% relative to the unconditional mean. When I go to NYSE stocks as a control group, it's a little bit bigger even. We find an 11 basis point increase, which is about 37% relative to the unconditional mean. So again, both quoted and effective spreads seem to be very consistently increasing when the floor closes for these NYSE stocks. Uh, again, I'll show you the parallel trends graph. I think it looks pretty darn good. Anyone who's ever done these knows they never look perfect, but I think these look pretty darn good. It looks like the gap occurs right when we first have social distancing on the exchange floor. Uh, it persists and it closes a little bit, but not fully when they reopen in May. All right, so I'm almost out of time here. Uh, let me let me show uh, just kind of the final sets of results. So we also examine price efficiency. So to the extent that liquidity affects whether or not traders have an incentive to impound information into prices. You might think pricing efficiency would change. So we'll look at Hasbrook pricing errors. Uh, what do we find? Again, the coefficients are positive, significant, remarkably stable across uh, specifications. We see pricing errors for the NASDAQ control group stocks increase about 6%. When we use NYSE as the control group, uh, it's about a 2% increase. Um, but again, the results are remarkably consistent across specifications. All right, last thing I'll say is, as I kind of run out of time, is we try to dig in a little bit to the mechanism. And, and I'll also say we're doing quite a bit more on that now that I, that I don't have re ready to show you yet. Um, but we'll look and see whether or not this idea of routine tasks is related to whether or not market makers and floor traders matter, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna compute a measure of complexity. And we're also gonna look at when these effects live. So first, let me show you, I'm gonna break out the trading day into half hour intervals. And what you actually see is, and I think this makes sense, the results are largely concentrated in the opening and the period right around the opening, right? So imagine you're a market maker, overnight news comes out, you have a hard task trying to understand what the open is gonna look like, what is going to be the intersection of supply and demand. And that's exactly when it looks like these, these floor traders actually matter the most. Uh, in the middle of the day, you see there's basically no effect from them. And then we do see a tiny little bit of evidence that they matter at the close. Last thing I'll show you then is if I interact our results with a measure of complexity, we again find basically that it is the most complex times of the day uh, when, when these results are strongest, right? So exactly consistent with kind of the Autor and, and Dorn idea. Um, so in the interest of, of time, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up. Um, we also do look a little bit at the opening and, and closing auctions to dig into that. Um, but in the interest of time, let me say that the last result, we are now exploring kind of the opening, uh, the partial reopening. Uh, and what you see is when they partially reopen the exchange on March, uh, May 26th, you see a partial but not complete reversal of the effects we documented. And again, I think this makes sense because even when they reopened on May 26th, 
uh, they didn't go back to normal, right? There was a significantly reduced headcount uh, and everyone's, there was no open outcry. Everyone still had to stand really, really far apart. Okay, um, but I'm out of time. So let me wrap up. Um, I, what we find, at, at least to me, was pretty surprising. We find actually floor traders matter, even in modern markets with high-speed algorithms. What you see is after floor trading is removed, effective spreads are higher, quoted spreads are higher, and prices are less efficient. Uh, and it seems like these results are related to complexity. So the human beings interacting on the floor matter more when, when times are complex. Um, and with that, I will, I will wrap up. Thank you so much. Um, the discussion of this paper is going to be Gideon. Gideon, you have about 15 minutes. When you have about two or three minutes left, I'll send you a friendly note to your chat. I'll post the friendly note to your chat window. Sounds good. Um, thank you, Byung. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Matt did a fabulous job presenting the paper, so I'm not going to repeat everything he said. I knew in advance he will do a fabulous job. So. Um, this is, this is not a very complex paper in some sense. And it's also not the first paper on flow versus electron, right? So Kumar had this paper comparing NYSC and, and Paris and found that flow is better than electronic. Pankaj had a paper looking at many international markets, finding the opposite, that when you introduce electronic, it's better. Uh, there are a couple of papers that are like even more relevant. I think Eric Thaisen and, and Alex Frino had two papers that show that when there's more volatility and uncertainty, um, uh, spreads are wider on electronic uh, system than, than flow system, which kind of is, is similar in spirit to what is found here. Um, but, but kind of th there's work on there, the results are mixed. Uh, what's new in this paper, it's the context, right? ReganMS created an explosion in algorithmic trading, both uh, agency algorithm, uh, High frequency trading algorithm. Uh, given that we are 14 years after Reagan MS, we've seen this entire evolution. Uh, the paper is asking are humans still contributing anything in the current post Reagan MS trading environment? Uh, and, and, and so that's, that's what the question is, is the, the question that the paper is trying to get. And from my perspective, it's a very timely and important question. And, and it's timely because, you know, there are exchanges now facing. Uh, that uh, that question and needing to make a decision and having more information about the consequences is better. And two weeks ago, I, I read in the Wall Street Journal an article that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange is permanently closing most of its trading pits. Basically, all the agricultural commodities, S&P 500, um, they, they closed it on, on March 2020, and then the euro dollar pit reopened in August 2020, but it didn't reopen the rest of them, and now they decided to close them permanently, that, that's the end. And this is a, an institution like the NYC with a storied past, right? We, we had those trading pits since, since the middle of the 19th century. Um, so are, are they making a mistake? Uh, do they know something we don't know? Uh, I'm gonna return a little bit to talk about it at the end, but this is certainly a very timely question. So I thought about what I can do to, to give some useful comments to the authors, and, and I'm gonna focus on three things. Um, and one of them will be something that I think is handled slightly less optimally in the paper, and, and I have a suggestion on, on how to, I think, handle it better, uh, and two just suggestions on things to do that may, may, may increase the, our insights or provide more insights. So the first thing has to do with the experimental design. And, and as, as Matt mentioned, there are basically two experiments in the paper, one using the NASDAQ control and the other one using what's, what's called the other exchanges control. And, and the NASA control is a very straightforward, very robust experimental design, right? Um, you know, one can have small quibbles. I mean, the, the Matt and Jonathan and Dominic control for price, volume, market cap, industry. Maybe they should control for volatility, given that it was COVID and lots of volatility, either in the matching or also in, in the regression. Given that it was COVID and maybe film survival was related to liquidity, maybe you want to, to match on film leverage or cash positions. Um, but again, more robustness can be done, but this is a very, very robust experimental design to begin with. Um, the other exchanges control, I, I, I find a bit trickier. And, and Matt knows about those things because he has other work that looks at um, natural experiments. But, 
but he mentioned this Zutva assumption, right? A stale unit treatment valuation. And, and basically it says, or one of the implications of the assumption is that there's no spillover from treatment to control. And, and I wasn't clear that this assumption is holding. In fact, I saw in the paper evidence that it's not holding. Um, and, and the key here is that routing in our model market is, is endogenous, right? If liquidity gets worse on the NYC or something changes, then the smart routers simply route the orders to the other exchanges. And, and so the liquidity providers on the other exchanges may face, they would need to cope with much more order flow, very different order flow maybe. And that can change their behavior. They will change their economics, their inventory cost. It may make it worse for them. It may make it better, right? It may make it better so NYC would look worse relative to them because now they can gain, learn information from more orders and so on. Uh, and in fact, the, 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 there's evidence, there's a footnote in the paper where um, Matt and Jonathan and Dominic says, look, market share during the continuous trading session and in the closing option, in fact, went to the other exchanges and was reduced to the NYC. At the opening option, it, it was the other way around. And I must say that my prior was that in an event like COVID, market share will flow to the NYC, right? We know that kind of from, from, from other contexts that when there's a lot of uncertainty, the order flow goes to the most trusted uh, venue. Uh, my colleague Maureen has a new COVID paper on, on bonds and there the, the volume goes to the dealers from the electronic platforms. And so my prior was that NYC will see more. And, and the fact that for most of the order flow in the continuous section and in the closing auction, it goes to the other exchanges, suggests to me that there are significant and severe routing decisions that are going on here. And so the liquidity providers on, on other exchanges uh, very much likely face very different environment. So, so in some sense, from my perspective, the question is, is worsened liquidity on the NYC due to not having floor interaction, which is what the paper wants to get it, or because NYC handles less volume, right? And with all the implications of that. And, and so from my perspective, the analysis should consider both to, you know, changes to the NYC market share and changes to liquidity together. Right? Currently in the, in the appendix, um, or online appendix, or the, the, the paper showed that in fact, the, the, the changes in market share are significant, but they should be together. And, and the solution that I would propose in this case is a two equation simultaneous uh, model spreads as a function of NYC market share and, market share uh, as a function of spreads. And we know that we need instruments to identify those things. My suggestion for the instrument for the spread equation is in fact what, what Matt and his uh, authors are using now, right? The, the spread on other exchanges, IT, uh, similar to what the paper is doing today. That's also similar to um, what Joel and I did in our low latency paper. And, and again, there's no problem doing this simultaneous in a different, different type of setting. As an instrument for the market share equation, I would suggest again, similar in spirit to what Joel and I did in our lower latency paper, kind of NYC market share, not I, right, T. Basically to take the, the market share of the other stocks at the same um, time. Um, you know, in, in my paper with Joel, because it was HFTs and we were thinking about cross stock things, we, we took out also the stocks in the same industry, stock in the same index, but I don't actually think that those considerations matter much here, but that should give you the, um, the market component without the term specific component. So the error term, you know, will be fine in terms of the, the inference. So I think that, 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 uh, that a more robust design in some sense can be implemented here uh, to get to conclusions. My, uh, my next suggestion is to add some additional dependent variables. And here, one of the uh, you know, results in the paper is that there's evidence of worsening liquidity in the morning. And, and that's taken to represent a more complex environment. There's, there's not in a lot of discussion in the paper of what is a more complex environment, but a natural place to start is that there's higher adverse selection in the morning, right? We know that from that's what every model with, with gradual learning of information, there's empirical evidence on that. And so, um, you know, if in fact, humans are better at dealing with adverse selection, filling the, the, the environment, then you would expect to get what, 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 in, what the paper gets. Uh, but there's a more direct way of testing for that, right? We've got a long tradition in market microstructure of decomposing the effective spreads into a permanent price impact that reflects adverse selection and a temporary price impact that, or, or realized spread. And, and, and they can, you know, um, create measures of permanent price impact daily, right? You can use whatever intervals, right? That's the difference between prevailing quote, mid quote, and subsequent one. 
Um, these days people use 60 seconds, five seconds, one second, even less, depending uh, on your preference. But, but there, if you find that an increase in the permanent price impact uh, happens after the flow closes, especially in the morning, that would be a much more direct evidence that liquidity providers need to protect themselves more from adverse selection without the ability to be on the floor. That I think would contribute to the paper. Another um, suggestion I had, and you know, I don't know if there's anything there, but I, I, I was intrigued. I had the flow closed on March 23rd, but the announcement was on Wednesday, March 18th. Uh, now, now, Matt mentioned that there's already starting after Wednesday, you know, some social distancing, uh, but they were still on the floor. And, and, and with that, you can actually have an a design that separates the announcement effect and the X date effect, right? If you want to control for day of the week, you have, you know, pre-event window for the announcement effect of Thursday, Friday, 12 and 13, and post-event window 19 and 20, and then the X date effect will be 19 and 20 compared to the week after. And, you know, in, in some sense, we all assume it's kind of the X date that matters, but I'm wondering, right, did, did order flow start migrating to the other exchange before the flow close? Just knowing that the flow close changed, you know, behavior of investors. Uh, so, so we saw deterioration on the NYC. It's not exactly the X date, it's, it's the intention of the investors. And I think it would it may aid to the paper to, to investigate. The last thing I would mention is kind of has to do with interpretation. So, so you know, the paper ends and, and Matt and Jondon says, you know, Humans continue to be valuable intermediaries in the age of algorithmic trading. And, and um, maybe, right? I mean, there's definitely evidence in the paper that is consistent with that. Um, there's, a, there's another new paper by Edwin and Dermot that basically look at the closing option, the NYC compared to NASDAQ. And they find the NYC is worse, but, but the important thing from my perspective is that they use COVID and find that when there's no floor brokers and there are no D orders that are, um, only floor brokers can do that in those are 30, about a third of the orders in the closing auction. The quality of the NYC auction actually improved when you close the floor. And, and that would suggest to you that, that maybe the, the answer is more subtle. I mean, is it the case that floor brokers have relative advantage because they're human, which is kind of the claim here, or because they had privileged access? And that's what, you know, Edwin and, and Dermot have. And, and another consideration is that it's clear that the brokerage houses in NYSC uh, didn't think it's going to be, it will take long until it, it reopens, right? I mean, uh, for example, they didn't try to replace the deorders with, with the electronic equivalent. They didn't do any of those things. Um, they didn't want to spend the, the time and money knowing that, that they'll open in a few weeks. Uh, but had they spent the time and money, um, the question is whether somebody can then create structures that are electronic, that, that, that are, are good enough to replace most of the benefits by humans. And that's, and, and, and it could be that the, the effect that we observe in the paper and that needs to be kind of acknowledged is because of the abrupt nature of the change, right? It, it's basically akin to, you close in a, a, a trading bin or you partially close a trading bin. And we know from the literature, there is evidence that if you close a trading venue, things become worse. Um, and, that, and that may be related to why the Chicago Mercantile Exchange um, decided to do something different, decided to actually close the floor. They had a year, right? They closed on March 2020. They had a year to develop the alternative procedures and mechanisms and, and, and things to, uh, to replace what was happening in the bid. And if they thought that that replacement was, was good enough, then they didn't see a need to reopen. All right, last thoughts. I enjoyed reading the paper. Um, my personal belief, and, and this paper, strengthen it, is that algorithms are still not good as human, especially at times of a lot of uncertainty, a lot of volatility. But what humans can do is slow the trading process, look around for more information and, and get better prices this way. Algorithms at the moment, in my sense, are not have not evolved to be as sophisticated in that sense. Of, it's very difficult for them to slow the trading process, look around. Um, and, and in that case, human trading can be beneficial, especially during time like, like COVID. So I think that Matt and Jonathan and Dominic are asking very important, very timely question. And I would love to see um, the next version of the paper, how it progresses. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. This was great.
And here at Cornell, we go to seminars, of course, to hear what the speaker has to say, but just as much also to listen what Gideon has to say about the paper. Um, Matthew, do you want to just briefly respond to some of the things, but maybe keep it brief so that we have yeah, I'll, I'll time for brief. questions Thank from the audience? That. that was awesome, um, as always. And um, I will just say, so one thing is actually, we have now done the decomposition of the spread. Uh, so that's a great idea, and we've, we've started digging into that to try to figure out whether these things are, you know, a change in adverse selection risk or, or you know, what's kind of going on there. The other thing I will say that um, we're working on right now that I think can help with some of your, your follow-up points is it turns out when they reopened in May, they allowed basically D orders to come back, but they didn't allow traders to talk and get in open outcry situations. So we're actually going to try to use that to tease out a little bit more on whether this is the special order types that actually matter or whether it's the ability to kind of interact and, you know, see each other in person that matters or both, right? It, it may very well be both. Uh, so that, that, those are things we're working on right now, but I, I, I love the comments. I appreciate it. Uh, 